This is South Carolina, also called the Palmetto State. South Carolina is mostly known for its beautiful places and smiling faces. The smiling faces and beautiful places of South Carolina. I'm totally shocked. Now is also one of the states leading the nation in crime. South Carolina has another side, a darker side, filled with Crips. East Coast low like Crip. Bloods. Gangster Disciples. All day, baby. IGD, my cell phone, run and tell that. Drugs. And even murder. Third most dangerous state in the union and number one in assaults. You've got assaults, you've got domestic violence, you've got hot tempers, you've got people living on the edge, you've got people not thinking uh, clearly, and they just commit my favorite word stupidness take a look at where we fall for all violent crimes according to a new national crime study fourth in burglaries fifth in murders tenth in rape and fifteenth in robbery but why is do or die down here to fully understand why south carolina is so full of crime you have to narrow it down to four major factors the first factor is education I know South Carolina has the worst high school dropout rate in America. The second factor is unemployment. Roughly one out of every 10 people in South Carolina is out of work. As it turns out, the state could be missing out on millions of dollars in unemployment benefits. The state's jobless rate reached a record high last December, giving South Carolina the fourth highest jobless rate in the U.S. The third factor is poverty. When you bring the economy into factor, unemployment rate, then things are going to increase. Burglaries are going to happen, uh, thefts, auto thefts, a lot of things will develop because these people have to feed their family. The fourth and last factor is drugs. South Carolina came in as the third most dangerous state. We rank first in assaults. Crime experts say our increasing drug and gang problem, along with a high unemployment rate, have pushed us up the list. Because more people are at home, because they're unemployed, because people have families they have to feed, they are looking for other alternatives. Credit give a nigga no trust when they don't give him no job. I mean, you got a lot of people that got charges. I've been in the county like 13 times, 13 times. You know, they can't really get certain jobs, you know what I'm saying? There's a lot of people that ain't graduated from high school yet. There's a lot of people yet don't even look about even going to college. So, their goals is way more different, you know what I'm saying? You might be trying to look for a job, they might be trying to look for that work. I mean, then if you ain't got the money to get that work, then you messed up. Because, I mean, you can't get no jobs, so where your money going to come from? In 2008 to 2009, South Carolina spent nearly $38 million against the war on drugs. Despite drug raids, drug kingpins still flourish. Take 23-year-old marijuana millionaire Celso Soriano Vasquez. Marijuana is the most used illegal drug in South Carolina. Half of all drug arrests come from marijuana. In 2002, a truck from Mexico to South Carolina was carrying over 900 pounds of marijuana to a Mexican store owned by 26-year-old Freddy De Leon. It is common practice to receive drug shipments by trucks, FedEx, and sometimes UPS. Eventually, the feds were onto their operation and Freddy's reign was over. He is now serving 25 years in prison and that made way for a new marijuana kingpin. State law enforcement division raided this house in Richland County and found block after block of marijuana some in this bedroom and its closet, more in another bedroom. Its closet stacked floor to ceiling. 
In the kitchen, they found a kilo of cocaine and more pot, along with garbage bags full in another room in the house. This all started with an arrest Wednesday in Greenville. That led investigators to this house in Richland County. They arrested one armed man inside and found the drugs. Their search led them to two other houses where they found cash. Four gym bags full of cash. SLED doesn't even know yet how much, but it's hundreds of thousands of dollars. They're also not sure yet how much marijuana they found, but estimate it's more than one ton. Celso and his network got their drugs into the city by using 18-wheelers. They used interstates such as I-20, I-26, and I-95. These three interstates are major drug trafficking interstates in the state of South Carolina. I-20 connects South Carolina to Atlanta, and I-95 stretches from Florida to South Carolina all the way to Maine. In 2010, Celso's reign had ended. When the authorities got him, they caught him with over a million dollars in cash, two pounds of cocaine, and over 2,000 pounds of marijuana. At $1,000 a piece, the street value can go up to over $20 million. Today was kind of the fun day. We got the cash, we got the bad guy, we got the guns, we got the dope. Now, he says, the hard work begins of trying to find out how far this extends and who's involved. So far, they've arrested two men, the one in Greenville during the traffic stop and the one at this house. But investigators say they're not the kingpins. This is a major operation. This demonstrates the amount of drugs that are coming in from Mexico. Next up is college drug kingpin. Tremaine Graham. He was the son-in-law of Atlanta Mayor Shirley Franklin. His mother-in-law could have never imagined her son-in-law had shipped over 1,000 kilos of cocaine into the United States. Authorities say he was among the leaders of the largest and most organized drug organization in South Carolina history. According to the DEA, evidence was linked to Graham personally supplying over 500 kilos of cocaine with the street value close to $10 million. But he wasn't always a cocaine kingpin. In his younger years, he was a student at Clemson University. But Tremaine wanted to live large. So in 2001, he and a college buddy planned to start a high-end car dealership in Atlanta. They had everything they needed to open their dealership except one thing, money. This is when the legend of Tremaine Graham truly begins. And he meets Detroit native Southwest T, who became a solid investor into the car dealership. Southwest T and his brother Big Meech, leader of BMF, had been major cocaine dealers since the 1990s. And unlike many, they created a drug empire worth a quarter of a billion dollars. Eventually, Graham got greedy and he started selling cocaine himself. Because of his connection with Southwest T, Graham was able to ship large amounts of cocaine to Greenville, South Carolina. Everything was going good until September 11, 2001. Because of September 11, security was heavy on the borders, which forced a reroute of cocaine that was being shipped from Columbia, South America to Columbia, South Carolina. In 1998, 
1,400 kilos of cocaine were seized at the port of Charleston, straight from the Bahamas and South America. After the terrorist attacks, cocaine shipments from South America now had to go through Mexico, and then Atlanta, and then South Carolina. The Mexican cartels wanted the same power Colombians had, and were willing to kill. More deadly violence tonight in Mexico's raging drug wars, and new concerns about the violence spreading through this country as Mexico's warring drug cartels extend operations into the United States. Casey Wyan has our report. From a shootout between two rival drug cartels in Culiacan, capital of Mexico's Sinaloa state, to the assassination of a state police officer and subsequent hostage standoff in the tourist haven of Mazatlan. At least 21 people have been gunned down since Thursday in Sinaloa. One local paper called it a bloodbath. And there's mounting evidence Mexico's drug cartels are spreading throughout the United States. The National Drug Intelligence Center reported this spring the cartels now operate in at least 195 U.S. cities. The report states that Mexican drug trafficking organizations are the most pervasive organizational threat to the United States. They are active in every region of the country and dominate the illicit drug trade in every area except the Northeast. Now because of the violence on September 11, drugs had to be transported in different ways to trick law enforcement. Graham used private jets to get the cocaine into the United States. And once they arrived, the cocaine was placed into coolers, boxed up, and then shipped to a fake address by a UPS carrier who was paid thousands to deliver the boxes to the real address. If that didn't work, they used vehicles with secret compartments to transport large amounts of drugs and cash. It started out in Mexico, then to California, then to Atlanta, and finally to smaller dealers in Greenville, South Carolina. By 2004, Graham was living large. So large, he had friends like Michael Jordan and Charles Barkley. Not only was Graham living good, so was his co-conspirator, Big Meech. He was hanging out with stars such as Young Jeezy, Fabulous, and Jacob the jeweler, who would eventually go to prison himself for money laundering for Big Meech. Not only was Big Meech making money and hanging out with stars, he was also appearing on DVDs. Everybody moved like brothers, and then everybody from different places, Milwaukee, St. Louis, Detroit, Texas, Atlanta, Cali, you know what I'm saying? Florida. We got people from everywhere in our mind. Everybody move as one. Everybody is prospering in some kind of way, in their own way. Every man plays his own role. And, it's, and everything start with the leader. I'm a good leader, so I got good people that follow. You know what I'm saying? It's simple. The attention from Big Meech's murder trial and the media backfired, giving authorities enough information to begin investigating him and his brother, Southwest T. And when they started investigating Southwest T, they also began building a case against Tremaine Graham. Many cell phone taps and cocaine seizures later, Graham was arrested and indicted by former Greenville U.S. Attorney Reginald Lloyd. In October 2004, Graham was released on bond and would go on the run until June 2005. And when they caught him, they found him with nearly two million dollars and over five million dollars worth of cocaine when the feds built their case against the drug network they had over 11,000 pages of evidence which included 150 suspects that stretched over six states finally in 2007 Tremaine Graham was sentenced to life in prison Finally, one of South Carolina's finest, Officer Matt Durham, the drug dealing police. <laughs> Wherever you go, there will be good cops and there will be bad cops. 
Questions from two South Carolina state troopers this morning after dash cam video shows them chasing down and hitting two suspects. In one video, the trooper slams into a man, then weaves his patrol car through trees and apartments, dodging children in his path. And there's the chase there. In a second video, a trooper plows into a suspect who tries to cross in front of his patrol car. The officers involved were given two to three day suspensions and remain on duty. Hey, I never had of him. Huh? I never had him. Look at that damn field. Well, he I went flying you... up in the air. I wish you. You hit him? Yeah, I hit him. Two, three, I'm to hit him. four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 13. Carl Allen is appalled at what he sees. This video appears to show his client, 18-year-old Jeremy Rucker, being punched 13 times by former Greenville County Deputy Brian Tollison. The camera keeps rolling. And then they have the audacity to come in and treat this young man as if he's a piece of meat and taser him with electrical jolts to his body. And then that's not enough for them. They then kick. Uh, three times to the torso. Judging by the tape, Allen says it does not appear his client posed a threat. I've seen nothing to justify the actions of these officers. Matt Durham started out as an officer for the Liberty Police Department. He was so good, he became a narcotics agent for Anderson County. Anderson is a county in South Carolina with over 20% of its people living below the poverty line. And wherever there is poverty, there is drugs. Anderson is a rest haven for drug dealers because it is located two hours between Atlanta and Charlotte. In 1998, Durham was involved in a routine traffic stop where he seized an ounce of crack cocaine. The search was considered inadmissible and the case was thrown out in court. Situations like these happened to Durham more than once, and he was tired of watching criminals achieve the American dream. He felt like it was time for his own piece of the pie. In the early 2000s, Matt began recruiting drug dealers to help him sell drugs. Once he found the right dealer, he provided the dealer money to buy up to a pound of meth worth $20,000, with the street value two times that. In exchange for the dealer's hard work, Officer Durham provided police protection and inside tips on what other buyers were working for the police. Durham's dealer paid him $5,000 a week for his cut from the drug profits. The money was good, but the money was so good, it ultimately destroyed Durham. In 2004, fellow officers began reporting Durham for his renegade tactics. His superior officers had waited long enough and requested SLED. A statewide criminal investigation agency led by former South Carolina U.S. Attorney Reginald Lloyd. Once SLED got involved, it didn't take long for a sting operation to end Officer Durham's drug dealing career. After he was arrested, a search of his home revealed a safe with over $200,000 in it. That ultimately sealed his fate. Once the money was seized, Matt Durham was sentenced to 13 years in a South Carolina prison. The big time guys I just mentioned aren't the only guys reaching for the American dream. We was doing our little thing, you know what I mean? We had three neighborhoods on Smash, you know what I mean? We had this one, we had, that's the woods over there, you know what I mean? We had Harbor Landing over here. We basically had all the fiends from, from any 
area, you know what I mean? From a whole bunch of areas coming straight over there to the spot. I had a big screen, I had all the trappings, and what I did was I had cameras and stuff out, but let me just say this, when it got down to it, I, I, I wanted to get out of it, because before I knew it, I, I don't want to talk about weight, but there was so many customers coming through, I could not morally accept the fact that I couldn't make money at it. I couldn't give it away enough. I couldn't keep enough women, and I started feeling bad about the things I was doing to the women and myself. Next thing, so what happened was, the police sent, um, what is it called, uh, confidential informants in, and they did a series of buys from me. And um, that's what happened. After that, they had a reason for a search warrant, and they just came in, kicked the doors in, and, uh, the common denominator in every case is money, greed, and prison. Stay tuned for episode 2 of South Carolina Drug Wars. Was his hustle was wrong, his mind was his own, but the man.